Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Good? Yeah? Fired up? I'm fired up. Let's go. Uh, Steven, uh, he just walked out. I, I got the mic now, so uh, be careful. Be careful. No, so I'm going uh, I'm to take the high ground and, and, and let that be. Just like I did last year when, when Corey tried to you know, embarrass me by him beating me in the 40-yard dash. It's, it's all good. I'll, I'll be the humble guy here every, once a year. All right? No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, it, it's been a pleasure to, to be uh, a part of this church and a part of what's happening here in Austin uh, to, to serve. And um, what the real pleasure has been is, is seeing these students, all high schoolers, come. So they, could, they could be in like Miami right now, you know, like Miami Beach or wherever, you know, like partying it up for spring break. But they chose to be here to come and, and not just serve this church, but serve the city. So I'm, I'm super grateful uh, for, for them and, and really proud of them for, for coming out and, and helping another year to, to serve Austin Life and to serve Austin. So uh, I just want to say thank you for, for coming and, and being a part. And, uh, and it's a privilege to stand here before you and, and talk to you guys today. So uh, it, it was cool to see on that video uh, that guys and girls just using hammers, right? The hammers, power, using power in their arms to, to bust through walls and, and ripping up carpet. And, and just a lot of energy and strength was uh, put into, into helping out a couple of the, the uh, people in, in the area. So it was really cool to see that. Uh, it's kind of uh, perfect for where we're going to be at today in Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. We're going to be looking at the amazing power of Jesus. We're going to be looking at the amazing authority that he had and the astonishing power he had over, over demons. Uh, if, so if you want to turn to your Bibles there, Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28, we're going to be looking at that. And I, I think it's funny as we turn there, just to be thinking about that, I, that concept of power. I think it's, there's a certain fascination that we have about power over, over, I think society is intrigued with, with uh, the idea of power and, and with, especially with powerful people, uh, from the athlete to the entrepreneur, from the physically powerful to the politically pow- powerful, people stand uh, in awe of people who have power, in, in, in my opinion. And, and so I started thinking about, okay, let me think about some people in like my world of, that have power. Maybe you could recognize some of these people. Uh, I uh, thanks to Corey and his wife and his family, they got me into watching Survivor. Uh, and uh, I just am in, really intrigued with how much power and authority that Jeff Probst has. You know, the, the host of Survivor. Yeah, I still watch it. I, I, I'll full on admit it. I know that's like a thing of like 2000, but I still watch that. And I don't know, when you look at Jeff Probst, I, I just think of like authoritative power. Sorry, I think I'm going out of order on the slides. I'm sorry. Uh, and then uh, also another person I think of, my wife got me into watching the Food Network channel because she's tired of watching ESPN with me. She wanted to make sure that we mix it up a little bit. So when I think of the Food Authority, I think of Bobby Flay. You guys know who he is? Like Bobby Flay. Like, yeah, the authority on food, I immediately think of over Giada and all those other people in there. Bobby Flay is a food authority. Uh, and then I also think of, this person is not necessarily real, uh, but those that are younger or who love Marvel comics, you can connect with me on this. Thanos, anybody? Thanos, like it, power. Like I all automatically think of like he has power when I, when I think of someone who has power. Even though he's not real, just work with me there. Uh, and then my wife kindly and gently, she is holy and blameless. When I was talking to her, can you give me some, um, like just some women of power? I don't want to just be all guys on here because, you know, I don't want to be chauvinistic and all that. So who do you, who can you tell me that has someone, that, a woman that has power and authority? Like who do you think of? And she kindly and gently said herself. And that's true. That's a true statement. Like, she's got all the power in our house, and she deserves it because she's the one that keeps things going through. So all you women out there, this is for you. Like, y'all have power and authority, as it should be. Uh, and so I, I think it's just interesting to think of when we think of power. And, and uh, what I want us to really, really latch onto as we go through this passage is that my prayer for you as we walk through this passage is that you would surrender Whatever it is that you are holding on to, whether it's control, whether it is maybe lust or there's some kind of addiction that you have, that you would surrender all of that, all of that 
to the saving power of Jesus Christ. That is my prayer. That when we look at the scripture, we can't help but be amazed and astonished by the saving power of Jesus Christ. So let's dig in. We're going to jump into Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. In this passage that we're going to look at today, we're going to see what happens when Jesus comes to church. Okay, Jesus came to church in this passage and some crazy things happened. Powerful things happened. People's lives were changed. They responded to what they saw was incredible. They were astonished by the power that Jesus had through his teaching and through his healing. And so my prayer today, along with us surrendering the power, is that we would not leave here just like we came in. We would leave here amazed and astonished at the power of Jesus. Not only just surrendering whatever we're holding on to, but grabbing a hold of his grace and walking out of here encouraged and ready to go on and spread the news of Jesus Christ. Because we all need that. We all long for the hope, the joy, and the fulfillment that is only found in him. So my prayer is that we see what happens when the word, the word, Jesus Christ teaches and speaks. And that we would be moved to go and, and, and not just come in here like, like we just ho-hum like every single Sunday we come in here. We get accustomed to doing all the things, worship, sit down, pray, and all those things, but yet we walk out of here unchanged. My prayer is that we would see how powerful God's word is, and you, when you look at it, you can't help but be changed. You can't help but be moved. Jesus taught with amazing authority. When we truly grab a hold of that, you can't help but be radically changed by him. You just can't. This kind of power that he has is the same kind of power that can take you from death to life. And when you receive that, the Bible says the Holy Spirit's indwelt in you and you have that power. You can't be not changed when you receive the power of Jesus. You can't be unchanged when you read the powerful word of God. You cannot be changed. So let's dig in, uh, just to catch up, to give you some context for those that, you know, are like me and I don't know anything when I first came to church, I didn't know anything about the Bible, nothing. Just giving you some context, the first uh, 20 verses or so is just a picture uh, of Jesus and him just being, doing things that God the Father has called him to do. And he's just going through and doing the things that God the Father has called him to do. In the very first uh, part of the chapter, Mark the, the writer of this, of this gospel just talks about how Jesus came to uh, basically announce forgiveness of sins. Uh, and so he came and did that, and then uh, he gets baptized, and then he starts preaching, and he goes to different areas uh, in, in, in where he's from and gets kicked out, and, and then he calls disciples and all these things. And so he is just on the move. Mark is pointing out how God, or how Jesus is on the move. He's on the move doing works and deeds. That is really what Mark is trying to show us. And he's doing it powerfully. He's doing it with authority. And it, people are being moved and changed. And so uh, we pick up in, in verse 21 where it says this. They went into uh, Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, he ordered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So they met in, uh, people met in a synagogue. And in verse 21, it talks about how they, they, ent- they met in a synagogue where Jesus came in. A synagogue is just a gathering place. A gathering place where they would uh, basically listen to people, scribes, just really talk about uh, God's word. They would reference other uh, other other people, and they would talk about God's word. Very similar to what's happening here, right? And so they would just really, really, they were theologians. They had like PhDs. You know, they were the, they knew a lot of things about God, and they wanted to teach it uh, to, to the the congregation, to the people in the synagogue. And what would happen is just like a, a, an order of service. And they would read the scripture and they would do certain things. And uh, that at the end, they would ask questions to the scribes. So it was just a time for them to, to gather. And, and every once in a while, they would bring somebody in to talk to them, 
right? And Jesus was that particular person in this particular passage. Jesus was the one that was coming to talk to them in place of, of the scribes that usually would, would teach. And boy, they were in for a treat when they, when they uh, received Jesus' word. We're going to find out in a second. And so he begins to teach. It's, it says uh, at the end of verse 21. And what happens is that they get, uh, they get amazed by his authority. So my first point today is that Jesus taught with amazing authority. Amazing authority. And in verse 21, it says that they were amazed at his teaching. That word amazed, in, in the Greek we translate it, it, it really means that they were, uh, they were struck by a blow. They literally, it was like they literally had the wind knocked out of them. You ever had that feeling before? It's kind of funny, James, for the first time, has, my son James has wind knocked out of him. He didn't know what to do. It's like, you know, you're just gasping for a jaw-dropping, uh, you know, type of feeling. Right, And so when Jesus was preaching to them, they were amazed at his teaching, it says. They, they couldn't help but drop their jaws. It was like they had never heard this before. They had heard from the scribes who had taught and you know, referenced other people and, and things like that. But they had never heard such teaching. They were amazed by how he was uh, teaching with such authority. Never before had that happened. And so they were amazed by that. And Mark is calling attention to us to see the reaction of the people to Jesus' teaching. They were struck with amazement in his teaching. And we're going to see that they were not only surprised, but they were a little bit terrified. They were a little bit uncomfortable when Jesus brought the truth. They had never heard anybody talk like this, and, and he was just exhibiting this, this sort of authority that they had never seen before or heard of before. It wasn't superficial. It wasn't anything like, we don't know exactly what he taught, and that wasn't the point of what Mark was trying to show us. He was just saying, like, Jesus taught with amazing authority, so much so that you couldn't help but be amazed and respond in, a, in such a way. And why was that? I asked myself, why were they so amazed by that? The reason is, is because this was the utter, Jesus was uttering the same thing that God the Father was uttering, right? He was God in the flesh. He is God in the flesh. That's why it was so amazing. That's why they had never heard it before, is because he was teaching exactly what was being written. He was the source of what everybody else was referring to. And they had never seen that before. Jesus is on the scene and they would never even seen that before. That's why they're amazed. Because the way he was speaking, everything was rooted in God himself. In God himself. They were filled with amazement and it is like they were pierced to the core when they heard his teaching. What a reminder that when we open up God's word, that he is the voice of authority. He is the one who is the truth. He, God's word is sharper than a two-edged sword, right? It, pier it should pierce us every time that we read it. What a reminder that is. And I think the one thing that I want us to really hang on to in this particular verse is... is Yes, his amazing authority and how he taught, and that it, the reason why it was so impactful is because he was, he is God. But the other thing that we need to hang on to is that this is the truth. We live in a culture that is searching for the truth. We live in a culture who's searching for hope and joy and fulfillment, especially right now in this COVID era that we're in. Jobs have been just wrecked. Lives have been changed, flipped upside down. Businesses are up upside down. Just some really strange things have been happening over the last year. And everybody's searching for something to hold on to. And I think that when we look at this passage, we can see that the one, thing that we, the one thing that we can hold on to is the truth, which is found right here in this passage. 
So I, I personally don't believe that all truth is relative and that it's just floating out there and your truth is your truth. No, I, the truth is right here and we can see that through what Jesus was preaching. And you see that in John chapter 14, verse 6. What does Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nothing comes, goes to the Father except through me. When I look at the Bible, the Bible is specifically saying this is the way, this is the truth through Jesus and only Jesus. It can be a little offensive when you hear that. But the Bible says this is the truth. Jesus was speaking as God because he was God. He is the source of the authority. God was speaking then and God is speaking now as you look into the Bible and look and read this passage. He is speaking to you. And my hope is that when we hear the word of God, it's not like we're just listening to just somebody standing up here talking. Our hearts should be filled with this, this holy awe that we're just, just, in, in, in just jaw-dropping amazement of what God is saying to us. Just like the people here, they were astonished and they were amazed by his teaching. So I encourage you, I, should, I want you guys to, to go deeper into God's word. Because the more that you do, the more that you get filled up with his amazing power. And the more that you can really handle what the world throws at you. Because you're anchored in the truth of God. That'll help us. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable. I think they were a little bit uncomfortable hearing the truth. But it's what we can latch on to and hold on to as we move forward in our lives every single day. Jesus came to church that day. He's here today. Where two or more are gathered, he's here. He's here today wanting to speak truth to you. Every time you look at the word of God, it should move you. That's how powerful it is. And then moving on, uh, Mark talks in verse 23. It says, just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit And he cried out, saying, what business do we have with each other? Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Immediately, this transition takes place from this uh, amazing authority that Jesus had in speaking the truth to all of a sudden to this astonishing power that Jesus has over demons, over unclean spirits. So we got Jesus teaching with with authority, and now we see him acting with authoritative power. And that word unclean that we see uh, in verse 23, uh, there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. That word uh, is talking about evil. There was was an evil spirit in him. There was an evil, uh, like, angelic creature, created being that uh, fell from heaven, right? And was looking for a physical body called a demon, basically. And I'm not going to get into all the details of what a demon is, but that's, that's essentially where this demon came from. It's a fallen angel, a spiritual being. There was a demon in the synagogue, and he was there disrupting service. He was there disrupting service. I just find that very interesting how a man with a demon inside of him came into service. It wasn't like he got through security or anything like that. He just came into service. I find it really interesting that when we come into service, we all, nobody knows where anybody's at spiritually. But we all, I'm sure, have some sort of demon that we're fighting against or we might be under control. And how cool is it that we can come to a place like this, no matter where you are in your life, to hear the powerful words of Jesus, to be healed. I love that. So there's this outburst by this demon. I'm sure it surprised everyone when he just starts yelling, right, (laughs) out of nowhere. I'm sure that they were really, really uncomfortable when he starts yelling and starts screaming out to Jesus and, and asking him who he is and why did you come to destroy us? But then he also admits, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Even the demons knew who Jesus was. They knew that Jesus was the Holy One of God. 
I find that so interesting that demons knew that, but the people in this passage, they didn't necessarily know that. And my question for you, you might be in here today seeking answers in your life, and you may not know that Jesus is the Holy One of God. He is God the Son. I find it interesting that here we are 2,000 years later and there are still people arguing about who Jesus was. The demons got it right. They knew who he was. They knew that he was God in the flesh. And they also knew that there was nothing that they could do to keep Jesus from having authority over them. Because Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. And we see over and over, all throughout the Gospels, Mark chapter 3, verse 11, Mark chapter 5, verse 7, the demons knew who Jesus was. They identify him as the Holy One of God, the Son of God. We see it over and over again. More and more evidence that Mark, the writer of this Gospel, is trying to show us that Jesus was the Son of God. Yet, despite hearing all these things, that people just, they just couldn't process it. I was asking my wife, I was like, why is that? How come when we read the word of God, how come when we come to church sometimes, we just kind of take this sort of uh, approach to, to his word and into church? How come we live our lives sometimes where we just are just kind of mediocre or just kind of you know, going with the flow? How come we don't live lives where we're in awe of being, with the, being empowered by the Holy One of God? My wife does, she's, she's um, I like to read the word. I love to read it. And my wife does too, don't get me wrong. But when, when she reads it, she kind of has sometimes a hard time connecting with it. It's like, she has an easier time maybe connecting with it on the screen or something. Like if you were to watch The Chosen, anyone seen that? The Chosen on, I forgot if it's on Pure Flix or Netflix, whatever it's called. Like, it comes, be able to see it gives emotion and, and gives some connecting tissue to, to be able to relate to it, right? And I want to encourage you all today. Maybe that's you. I believe that the word of God is powerful and if you read it, it should change you absolutely. And that should be your primary source. But maybe you need some supplemental things like watching The Chosen to help really, really connect with the fact that Jesus took on all of our sin on the cross so that we didn't have to, so that we could have change in our lives, so that we could live a life that is radically changed. A life that wants to draw other people in to experience the same thing and encounter God. I think about that a lot. How come we haven't, how come we look at God's word and we don't get changed? It's powerful enough to change our lives, to rescue us from going from hell to heaven, to rescue us from the domain of darkness to the the kingdom of the beloved son. How come we just look at God's word or we sit in here in church and just, we aren't just really moved like the people who are here in this passage? I think we really need to think about that today. And think about having a holy reverence and awe over God. Moving on to verse 25, it says this, and Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. I love this. This is my favorite part of the passage. Jesus is talking to the demon and he says, be quiet, come out of him. You know what? This is like, you know what this translates to in 2021? Shut your mouth. That's what Jesus said. Me and Corey were talking yesterday, like how just kind of have a little bit of aggression towards things. Like this is, Jesus had some aggression towards the demon. He said, shut your mouth. I love that. He confronted the demon and said, be quiet. And just the words of that made the demon, in verse 26, start coming out. 
throwing him into convulsions. Uh, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. What power. I can't even, I can't even say that enough to really do justice to what we see here happening. He didn't do like what we see in the movies, like some weird exorcist, you know, ritual or something where he has to, you know, you got to do all these, you know, all these weird stuff. No, he just said, shut up. That's it. And that was enough for the, the demon to come out. That's how powerful God's word is. You should be amazed by that. I'm amazed by that. The demon obeyed the words of Jesus. And we can see that Mark is demonstrating that Jesus had authority over the fallen spirit world, over the demons, and over Satan, just by his words. Incredible to me. And then, of course, everyone around were like, in verse 27, they were all amazed so that they debated among themselves, saying, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. They were amazed. They were, they were astonished. They were taken aback. They were actually kind of scared. They were fearful of what was happening. That's the kind of amazement that is just being described here. They were so amazed that they started talking to themselves. Like I said before, in the synagogue, the, the, the typical like, order of service would be at this point, you start asking questions. They decided not to do that. They just decided to start talking to themselves because they were so thrown off by what was going on. They should have asked questions to him, to Jesus, but instead they preferred to debate amongst themselves because they were, they'd never seen something like that before. It was unheard of. That new teaching was unheard of. It was fresh. And it was something that they couldn't grasp. And so they started talking about it themselves. He commanded the demon just with his words to come out. And the demon came out. That was a huge deal back then. Huge deal. It's a huge deal now, obviously. But back then, it was like, man, during that time when Jesus was around, it was like all hell broke loose. There was all, if you read through the Gospels, there's all kinds of demons running around. Go look at Mark chapter 5. You see the man with the the demonic uh, spirit in him. It was all, it was very common. And so they thought that everything that bad that happened to you was because there was a demonic spirit. If you were sick, it's because you had a demon inside of you. If anything bad happened, it's because you had a demon inside of you. And they did, they went to great lengths to try to get it, to get it out. Even like drilling holes in their head and stuff like that. Like it was crazy. So for Jesus to just say, shut up and get out, and the demon comes out, they were just like, whoa, like what? What is this? That's how astonished they were. And that's how significant it was. Suddenly, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Jesus identifies himself as the one. The one who can solve all of their problems. The one who can remove the demonic spirits. The one who can deal with all the issues in their lives. My question for you today is, do you realize that? Is there something, maybe not necessarily a demon inside of you, but is there some sort of demon type thing like fear or anxiety or depression or lust? There's, is there something in you today that you need to lay before Jesus and surrender to. Trusting that he, just by his word, can get, remove that from you. And it's a process. We go, through all, we go through that a lot in our lives. I'm doing great with the Lord. I've got confidence. I love him. I got no issues. And then all of a sudden, three months later, you somehow find yourself struggling with why God is not answering my prayers. And so instead of leaning into him, I'm going to go another way. I'm going to go my way because I don't hear anything. And next thing you know, you're, you're surrounding yourself with things that aren't of God. And so today might be that day for you. Maybe you're holding on to something that you need to let go of, that you need to surrender to the amazing power of Jesus, trusting that the word of God, the incarnate word of God, 
can get that out of you. Well, we see in, in verse 28, I think some people realized it because immediately the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. I think some people realized what I'm talking about today, that they realized and believed in Jesus, that he was the one who had enough power to heal people from their sins, to remove whatever evil spirits were inside of them, and to save them. And so they went everywhere. Do you see? There was a response. They didn't leave here. They didn't leave church, the synagogue, the same way that they came in. They had an encounter with Jesus. The incarnate word of God. And they were moved. And they went and told everyone about it. That's my last point today. It says we need to surrender to the authority of Jesus. I think that people in this synagogue, some of them believed that, and they did that. And they did just what I think the, the writer of Hebrews did in Hebrews chapter two, verse 14. See, I think the people here didn't quite understand, what, fully understand who Jesus was, but they had an encounter with him, and they were completely changed. They were radically changed because they realized, just like the writer of Hebrews realized that through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. What we all can realize today is that we don't have to be afraid of death when we receive Jesus. We don't have to be afraid of all the junk that goes on in this fallen and broken world when we receive Jesus. We don't have to live life as if that's all that there is when we receive Jesus. Because we know that every day, every year moving forward, we are moving forward and toward the beginning of a new life with Christ in the new heavens and the new earth. And so we can be reassured no matter what happens, that we have victory over death, we have victory over sin, we are more than conquerors in Christ. We can be assured. I love it. Jesus came to church in this passage and they were astonished and amazed at his teaching and his power. Jesus is here today with us. By the power of his spirit, he is here with us. And if you've heard the word of God, you can't help but be changed. It is so powerful. Me and a couple guys went to go visit Esther Rosa's the lady that you saw on the video. And at the end, she prayed with us and, and she talked about how uh, she's experienced a lot of hardship in her life. I think she talked about how she had several family members pass away through murder, uh, through sickness, through COVID, and through suicide. And she said, yeah, it's been hard. And there's been a lot of temptations to go a, a certain way. And we talked about that and how one of the students was there was talking about how they had recently got baptized and how uh, even after we got, he got baptized, he's been dealing with a lot of temptations to go the wrong way. And Esther said something that like just completely changed my perspective on things because I've just been wondering and thinking about how does this passage apply to us today? I could not, for the life of me, figure that out. I can see the text. I can explain it to you guys and, and show you that this is what we should feel. But I sat there and I was just like, I don't know how this passage applies to us right now in 2021. But what she said, I think, applies to all of us today, and it's from the Bible. Like I said before, earlier on in Mark, Jesus had to go into the wilderness and be tempted by the enemy. And how did he get through that temptation? How did he get through that struggle? It's by the word of God. is by the word of God. 
And who is the word of God in the flesh? Jesus Christ is. And when you receive him, you have that. And this is what Esther said that really changed my perspective that I'm going to completely hold on to. It's out of 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Greater is he that is in me than in the world. That's how we overcome all of this. When he's in you, you, you are greater than any kind of struggle that you might be dealing with today. You're greater than whatever setback you have in your life that you're wrestling with today. You're greater than whatever setback you might have tomorrow. Greater is he that is in you than than he that is in the world. He is greater. There is power at work in this passage and there is power at work in your soul. That is greater than all evil. It's the power of God that's shown in us through Jesus Christ. I just, I just love that. I love thinking about that. We need to be preaching that to ourselves over and over and over. Jesus came to be the human bridge across people uh, to, to help us climb to safety. He's like that out, out he's got his arms outstretched to you right now, out there, stretching out to you to carry your cross, whatever problems you got going on. And you know what? It cost him his life to do that, but it made it possible for you to have a new life. So the question is, have you accepted that new life? And will you allow Jesus to silence whatever demons you have in your life Will you surrender to him? Will you surrender to his saving power? So I, I just think about this passage and I'm just going, there's, there's, there's got to be a response. There's got to be a response. And I'd like for us to take a minute to think about that. What's your response to what we see in this passage? Are we just going to walk out of here just like nothing ever happened? Like we didn't just look at the powerful word of God? Or are we going to walk out of here changed? I can't do that for you. The Holy Spirit can. It's the only one that can. But these people, they left changed by his words and actions because Jesus came to church. And Jesus is here with us today. So let go of whatever you have. Surrender it before him and grab a hold of his grace. Jesus came to set you free today. And I hope that you accept that free offer, that free gift of salvation this morning. And if you already have, I just pray that you would lay down whatever burdens you have right here today. Surrender to him. We're going to sing a song that talks about that surrender. Talks about the the power of Jesus breaking us free of whatever chains is holding us back. I hope that when we sing this song that it's, it's also a confession of our brokenness before him. Of our lack of power and control that we we think that we have in our lives I know there's someone people in here today we think we have control of our life we think everything is going good we think we're fine but we're really not we need something more powerful to break us free so let's just be still for a second They'll play over us for a second and then we'll worship to the song that I think that should be a confession, a surrender of not just our lives, but of control and whatever it is that's holding us back. Lord Jesus, thank you so much.
for the hope that we have in you. Every single day, I make mistakes. My thoughts are not the best. I know I say things that I shouldn't say. I know I don't live a life that is constantly grateful for for you. And that should leave me in despair when I think about it, but it doesn't because I also think about how you hold me up. You forgive me. And each and every single day, your Holy Spirit is working in me to move me to a point to where I become more like you. That's so beautiful and that's so true. And I pray that over us that we would realize that we would walk out of here changed, ready to live for you. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray.